Hello and welcome to this Career Insight episode. And in this conversation, I'm joined by Bilal Hafiz, who is the founder, CEO and head of research at Macro Hive. But he's also had a pretty phenomenal career. He's worked in global head positions at the likes of JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank and Nomura. He joined me for a conversation about an article he's put out to mark his 25th year anniversary of working in finance entitled 25 Lessons Learned in Those 25 Years. And in this conversation, he joined me to talk over five key points that I think will really resonate with you. So in this conversation, we talk about a lot of different things, but I think you'll really enjoy it. He has such an open, honest approach. He's the mentor that we wish we always had personally. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy the session. Okay, hi, Bilal. Perhaps before we kick off, you could cover two things for me. One is a brief summary of your kind of career history, because I'm just conscious of the fact that not everyone um, might know of you at this point. So that would be really good to, to kind of give some context. And then also uh, the rationale. Obviously, you, you put out this great piece about your 25 lessons from 25 years in finance and just really wanted to know that, that why, why do that? And why did you feel the need to, to share some of your, your insights? Great. Um, yeah, just to start with, in terms of my, my career, um, I, my career started as when I went to join JP Morgan as an intern back in 1997. So I was studying economics at university. Uh, I was at Cambridge. And in the penultimate year, you do internships. And so I applied for lots of different internships and I ended up at JP Morgan. And so that was the beginning of my career in finance. And by the end of the internship, the way these things work is that you end up with a graduate job offer. And so I got the job offer. So when I graduated in 98, I started off at JP Morgan. Um, now, as it happens, at the time, there was this massive technology boom in markets that was going on. And mergers and acquisition, M&A was the hottest area to be in. So I actually asked to go into M&A, tech M&A as the area. So I went off into that area, went on a training program in New York in, in, in late 1998, and that was the beginning of my career. Now, what ended up happening is when I came back to London, started to actually work in M&A, I absolutely hated it. And within a few months, I asked to transfer to the market side, so the side of, of the bank where you do sales, trading, and research. And I moved into research at JP Morgan in London, and this must have been in early 1999. Um, and then as it happened, that team I joined was the foreign exchange research team. You know, I just got allocated to that team. And they they just said recently or about to appoint a new head of FX research, um, this Argentinian chap called Alfonso Pratt Guy. Uh, he ended up becoming a massive mentor to me. And he really sort of settled me down into that role. And I, I got this kind of sense of this is the role I want to be in. And so that began my sort of long stretch as a researcher on the sales side. So I started off at JP Morgan, my real proper job was FX research. And I kind of started off uh, there, initially working on kind of the more modeling, more technical side. Now by 2002, Chase Manhattan took over JP Morgan. There was a big sort of takeover, big merger, and there lots of changes going on at JP Morgan. So I decided to leave, lots of my colleagues were leaving at the time, and I went to join Deutsche Bank in 2002 in, in London. And Deutsche Bank back then was beginning to become a powerhouse in global markets. They were doing this massive build out. They were hiring lots of talent from across the street. And, you know, within five, 10 years, they became one of the biggest fixed income uh, foreign exchange FX rates uh, banks in the world. So I joined that division, FX. Um, I ended up having a great career as an FX research analyst, ended up heading up the research uh, team at a very young age, became managing director again at a very young age. Then the financial crisis hit in 2008, which was obviously a big shock to the, to the system. And there was a lot to learn from, from that episode. Um, and then soon after that, I thought it's better to be outside of Europe uh, and the West at that time, because the global financial crisis was quite depressing. So I moved out to Asia and I, and I moved to Singapore, where I headed up research out of Singapore at Deutsche Bank. And so I was there for a number of years, enjoyed it, uh, learned a lot about China and the rise of China and Asia. But after a few years, I realized and my family realized we didn't actually like it that much in, in, in Singapore. We preferred London. So we moved back to London. 
And I ended up in London heading up a new uh, research group, which Deutsche Bank had set up called a multi-asset or cross-market research group. And then on top of that, I was also part of and ran a, a special research unit for the CEO of Deutsche Bank, you know, aren't you, aren't you Jane? So I did all of that for a few years. But then by the end of 2015, early 2016, I decided I had enough of working at Deutsche Bank. I was there for a long, long, long time, and it was my time to, to part, part ways. And then I moved to Nomura in London, the Japanese investment bank, and I ran research out of London there for three years. Um, but by 2019, you know, I kind of felt like I'd spent so much time on the sales side that I, and I had so many ideas of how to do startups that I thought, let me do a startup in research. So in 2019, I set up MacroHive um, with a along with a number of other people, and uh, we've I've been running doing that for the last three years now, uh, and we essentially provide uh, research to some of the, the biggest investors in the world, some of the top hedge funds, asset managers, and then we also have a product for students and individual investors as well. Mm. So I, I, I can definitely see where the rationale for this piece probably comes from. I mean, you've got such a, a broad background in a sense, going from M and A. To different banks, US to European, to different geographic cultural locations, to setting up teams, to waking your way up to, <laughs> you know, and then you mentioned having a great mentor. So is have that mentor impact to you? Is that partly why you feel like now at 25 years in, this is a good time to share some of the things you've learned? Yes, absolutely. And you know, I, I think one of the sort of luckiest things I've had is I've had you know, people with more experience mentor me early on in my career. So with my job at JP Morgan, Alfonso was a massive influence on me. He really helped me uh, a lot at that time. So he was in, in some ways passing on his experience to me, whether explicitly or not, through his actions and the way he was interacting with me, that's what he was doing. And even earlier when I was at, at school, um, you know, I, I grew up in a kind of a working class area, you know, you know, it wasn't such a nice school, but my my economics teacher was a real mentor to me, and he really encouraged me to study economics and, and push myself. So again, that's that's an example of somebody who's more seasoned, more experienced, give it kind of passing on their their experience. And so that's that's part of the motivation for doing this. You know, you know, sort of sharing my twenty five years. And another motivation is I get asked a lot. Yeah. different people you know <laughs> what's your advice life advice and, and so on and I think about these things a lot you know I, I I'm, I'm always thinking about how can I improve my life about learning from the wisdom of elders from you know older spiritual texts and you know I'm, I'm really uh you know like to mm -hmm. to try to improve myself and, and and help others in that way yeah just just given your just before we go into some of the the points I wanted to highlight from the article just given your your background you mentioned it about school and perhaps in a way particularly when I think back to the 90s quite um let's say a lot of people come from a traditional private schooling background let's say for example that particularly go into investment banking side of of the business did you ever feel given that you also became quite senior quite quickly as you said becoming an md at a young age did you feel imposter syndrome at any point because the people around you perhaps are of because ethnically they might have been different or yeah. from a class background they might have been different did you ever feel that early on in your your career yeah there definitely was an element of that i would say the biggest cultural sort of um challenge i found was actually going to cambridge university so i grew mm. up in this kind of right uh, you know like ethnic working class area as it happened it was in Oxford but there's a side of Oxford that's not so nice and I grew up around there and so going to Cambridge which is the epitome of you know privilege and history and and all of those sorts of things that for me was a biggest the, the biggest transition you know going to formal hall where you wear gowns you have so many forks and knives I mean I, I literally was the guy you've seen the movies not knowing which forks and knives to use you know because I grew up in a household where you tend to eat with your hands uh, you know my, my parents are originally from Pakistan and you eat, you know you eat with your hands generally um and so um so that was a big big sort of cultural clash um and then working within banks I, I did feel an element of not fitting in but strangely banking tends to be quite a good place for people who are a bit different because uh, there's lots of odd people in banks okay and one thing I did find that was interesting was that JP Morgan was a very sort of American bank 
uh, ethnically very white as well at the time I was there. But then I moved to Deutsche Bank and Deutsche Bank was much more multicultural. Um, so there was lots of people from India that were there. There were lots of, uh, you know, like Lebanese people. I mean, it was, it was actually surprisingly diverse. And I did notice when I joined Deutsche Bank that I just felt more comfortable because I, I just saw lots more people that looked like me in senior roles, whereas at JP Morgan, I didn't find that at that time. And so while I may not have been as aware of it at JP Morgan, I think I did have that element of imposter syndrome and just feeling like I'm not, you know, like, like everybody else. But at Deutsche, it was the opposite. I actually felt much more comfortable. Um, and um, the other thing I would also say is there's also distinct difference I find between banking, like M&A and trading. Hmm. Banking, I tend to find, tends to have the, the vibe of being more elitist. You know, there, there seems to be a bit more of just the way people dress, the way they act. It's more about your title and your background and so on. Whereas trading, you tend to find people of diverse backgrounds. So often you have people from a very working class background who go into spot trading. FX is famous for that. Um, you often find people who are quants, who are these kind of you know Russian geeks, you know, <laughs> like you have on the desk and so on. So you know, because in some ways trading is is much more, um, you know, your your validation is day to day market prices, whereas M and A is more relationship driven. You end up with a sort of a different sort of subculture there. So, you know, at Deutsche, I didn't find uh, as much of that imposter syndrome. Cool. Okay. Well, look, let let's let's dive in then. And I know there's 25 lessons, but obviously we'd be here quite a while to go through and thrash <laughs> out all 25. So. What I've done is in advance of us talking, I've picked out five of which I think are going to kind of provide the most value for, for our community and, and it would be great for you to kind of build up on them. So to quickly run through the five and then we'll kick off with the first one. So the five are money is everything, money is nothing. Second one, failure is the best way to level up. Three, start with what you fear. Four, be effective, not efficient. And five, learn every day or quit. <laughs> and so let, let's start with the first one then. So uh, money is everything and money is nothing. And I thought this is a great one to kick off with because we work with lots of young people who are about to make what they feel like is the most important decision of their life. And there's lots of influences that they see and receive. Um, and money is obviously a quite big one. So your, your take then and what you mean by money is everything and money is is nothing. Yeah, I wanted to start off with this one because a lot of people don't want to talk about money. You know, mm. it's, it's one of those things that you try to avoid talking about. But everybody is thinking about this when you join, you know, finance, you want to get paid well. You hear about people with impressive bonuses. You hear about hedge fund managers who are billionaires. And in some ways you want to become like those or accumulate the wealth that they have. Um, so I wanted to sort of put this up front, but also the other reason for talking about this was that the product of finance companies is money itself. That's the product that we're all involved in. You know, it's money's crossing borders. You're using money to buy other companies. You're you're trading money in different forms. So the product is money, and that's unusual because every other industry. The product is something else. It, it's a car and then use money to buy the car. But the company's focus is buy, build a car or it could be law. You know, it's write contracts, you know, but in banking, the product is money. <laughs> yeah, that is the product. And so and what that means is everywhere you, you turn, you'll be facing money in different forms. Mm. And so you can't escape it. And, and that's what I mean by money is everything. So, for example, I started off in foreign exchange in, in, in the early days. And foreign exchange is the largest market in the world. Like today, about every day, it's six or seven trillion dollars is traded each day today. It's huge amounts of money. So when you're on a foreign exchange trading floor, somebody buying $100 million of something or $500 million of something is not really a big deal. You know, that it, it just happens. So suddenly you start hearing these numbers, $100 million, and yeah. it's nothing. And then you think <laughs> about your own salary. Oh, I'm on 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, even a million. <laughs> it sounds like it's too small relative to, to that. And so the first thing you have to do is you have to become aware of how being surrounded by money starts to affect you. And one big thing that happens with money is it makes you very comparative. It, you know, as soon as people start to talk about money, you start to think, okay, what's my salary? Mm. Um, how's it compared to other people? You start to judge other people on, in monetary terms as well. And of course, you never can pay yourself below, you can pay yourself above. So I, I used to, you know, every year when I used to get my bonus, uh, you know, you'd get your bonuses in banks. 
I'd always feel unhappy, you know, even though the numbers were amazing. <laughs> when you think about it, you know, even get, guessing a bonus is, is amazing, but you'd always hear about somebody else who you compare yourself to who got more. Um, and then another subtle thing is when you start to interact with people outside of finance, you start to think, okay, I wonder how much that person is worth or has. And, and so it has this kind of corrosive effect on you where you start to judge everybody through a monetary filter, which is, is, is not really a good thing because people and every, everything has a lot more value than that. And so that, that's one thing to understand this corrupting influence of money that it can have on you um and, and and the irony here is if you obsess about money it doesn't necessarily make you better at your job in finance uh, either you know it, it can also lead to you you know to become self-destructive in different ways mm. at the same time i'd also say that money is nothing in the sense that the true value of of things is not linked to money so the the value of things is it could be how good are you at your job which which is not necessarily to do with money directly it could be to do with okay how good are you at discerning um, people's behavior in the market so that you can trade well as a researcher? How good are you uh, at modeling different types of behaviors? That's not necessarily to do with money per se. It's, it's something else. It's a skill you need to accumulate. How good are you working with people, managing people? That's not money. That's something else. The other thing is that money is... Uh, is at some level of social construct. It's not real. You know, you have a car that's real, that's tangible. Mm -hmm. Money isn't. You know, money only exists uh, as a source of value because we trust that whoever's creating that money isn't going to print an infinite amount of that. That's why you want to hold that piece of money. And so when you scratch away the surface of money, you realize the foundation of it is trust. And so if you stop trusting the person that's involved in money, then you'll stop uh, engaging with, with that. And that's also one of the things we've learned with banking is that when people stop trusting banks, then the bank goes bankrupt, which we learned from the global financial crisis. So very quickly, this obsession with money and money often makes you take shortcuts. It often makes you sort mm. of uh, lie to people. That also could lead to a massive unraveling of yourself and, and of the industry. And, you know, often people end up, you know, getting sacked because they sort of broke, broke someone's trust mm. uh, as well. So, so money is everything on the one hand, but it's also nothing as well. So just looking back in retrospect over your 25 years, do you think that there was a particular moment that saw you transition out of, I guess, the chase and compare, uh, comparing yourself to then something a little bit more above that? Yeah, I mean, for me, it has to be the global financial crisis. Mm. You know, one, because before that, I was, you know, I had lots of fire in my belly. I was rising up really quickly and and you know, when you're in finance at that point, it really did feel like there was no limit to how far you could go or how much banks could do. But the global financial crisis dramatically changed that, you know, within a week of Lehman's going down, I thought my, you know, the whole financial industry would vaporize that, you know, there, there wouldn't be a banking industry left. And then I suddenly thought, what, what other job can I do? You know, could, you know, would I need to go into teaching or something? I mean, so suddenly you realize mm. everything you thought was so valuable was not valuable at all. On top of that, the social status of banking changed as well. So when I told people I worked in finance, suddenly you were looked down upon. And so suddenly that everything about you sort of changed where you thought you were, you know, master of the universe, you know, <laughs> using a term from uh, Tom yeah. Wolf um, in Bonfire of the Vanities, uh, suddenly that all changed. So that for me, that was a big shock where at a very visceral level, you felt like everything had gone and so then you realize actually what do I really value then so you start to think about you know who do you care about relationship wise um, you then think about um, career wise what can you now do um, you start to think about um, you know the, the hopes you had around money whether they were misplaced or not and then there was all this kind of cultural revolution going on in banks to sort of change their cultures to make them you know less aggressive and so suddenly everything changed after that. Mm. And a lot of young people I talk to at the moment are coming to the end of their kind of education period, going into the workplace at a point where you're hearing the Bank of England saying we're going to have the, a deep, long, protracted recession. You know, we, we, they're seeing headlines, in other industries, let's say Twitter, Facebook, slashing thousands of jobs. They can't help but feel apprehensive. Is there anything that you could say that from living through a period like the financial crisis to alleviate that tension that actually there's lots of creativity and innovative, innovative solutions that come out of this jobs perhaps that that we haven't thought of or situations that might materialize in the future uh, just to 
kind of uh, give some confidence <laughs> to those who are just coming into the system, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, w- one thing I would say is that having been through a number of crises now, mm. so when I started off in banking, I was a summer intern during the Asia financial crisis. Then when I was a then when I was on my graduate training program in 98, we had the LTCM hedge fund crisis and, uh, you know, fellow people at other banks were laid off, you know, because banks were making losses back then. And it really did feel like things were kind of, were, were going to be so ending, uh, you know, at least to the job prospects. So, so the one thing I would say is that nothing's permanent, you know, so there is going to be a downturn or there may be a recession, but it won't last forever. You know, there, there'll be a big upturn. And so whatever negativity there is out there, there will be some positivity thereafter. So, so one is there's, it's a cycle. Just remember that it won't last forever. Um, secondly, I think that when there is a recession or crisis or those sorts of things, things go into flux and lots of things change. And that often can lead to lots of interesting opportunities. So sometimes what happens is that banks often would say, okay, we need to let go of the more senior people and we need to get more junior people to manage costs. So that that's the advantage of, of younger people. Um, it could be that... Uh, in the current environment, um, a lot of resources and lots of people were going to technology. Maybe they'll switch and go to finance instead. You know, often banks and and financial um, entities do quite well during recessions. They, you know, certain certain you know aspects of them, you know, macro does very well in that mm. environment. So so there's areas of finance that do very 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 well. And then also there's geographical dispersion as well. So maybe the UK is doing poorly, but maybe the US will do better. You know, maybe China at some point will sort of pick up again and Hong Kong will do better. So there's always this sort of dispersion as well. So so I think when when things are in a state of flux, lots of opportunities can open up as well. And and then also just remember things ultimately are, are quite temporary. Yeah. Good advice. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, then, let's move on to the, uh, the second point. Comes from a slightly different category uh, that you've listed in the actual full article. But failure is the best way to level up. It kind of sounds a little bit Michael Jordan esque in, uh, <laughs> yeah, in yeah. that saying. But what's your take on on failure and how we can learn from it? Yeah, I mean this this comes comes down to how do we change as people? You know, so the idea is we we you know always want to improve and change and so on. But ultimately, can you really change as a person or not? You know, like you have friends or you're in relationships and you think, will that person ever change or not? Um, so how do you change? And the irony is that I think the the possibility of changing is much, much higher when you're failing than when you're succeeding. Because when you're doing really, really well, there's no need for you to reflect on yourself or to do something different because you're doing well. And that's often, you know, people become quite arrogant when they're doing well. And you as a friend could tell them, why didn't you change? They'll say, no, why should I? I'm doing well. So it's really failure so is the foundation of change and leveling up. So when you go through some kind of failure or setback, you know, for example, you may not get a job, um, you may not get promotion, you may get a pay cut rather than a pay rise. Um, you may have had a, you know, some project you're working on doesn't go down well, or some trading book doesn't do well that's really the time which you have a massive incentive and this internal impulse to look to how you can prevent that happening again. So, th- so, so that, that failure should become the, uh, sort of the, the fuel for you to look into yourself and say, what, what can I do to change? So you have a choice almost, like when you, when you get hit by a failure, you can either close in on yourself and become all sort of closed and depressed and unhappy and angry. You, you can go to a place of negativity or you could go to a place of positivity to say, oh, hang on, whatever I was doing before didn't work here. So what can I do differently now to make things work better? And so these setbacks, you know, while it's tough to say this, um, you should almost embrace because that gives you some information that you didn't have before about how you can be different uh, around a certain situation and then you can learn what it is you need to do better now it may, it may be for example um you know you might realize okay i need more technical skills you know so you know 
just being good at Excel is not good enough. I need to learn Python, you know, because mm. for whatever project I was working on. So then you go learn Python and then you've improved your, your skill. Um, it could be that you weren't able to trade a market really well. And so then you go and learn some new technique or learn something about that market that helps you improve. Mm. Um, so so I, I just think in the end, if you want to improve and change, it's really failure is really the only time that you as a person are open to that possibility. Mm. It's almost like the how society placed failure. And I guess it's a byproduct of maybe our youth and education system, whereby failure is deemed in an academic sense as not succeeding. But what's interesting, because I'm very keen on sport, you look at professional sports and they'll review religiously as part of the post-match process. They'll watch videotapes of the good, the bad, and then they'll look to improve and tweak. It's funny how we don't have that inbuilt mechanism. We actually have to create it for ourselves where we can accept failure is a part of the process. We can learn from it and we can pick out these elements to improve and then try again and then work at it to improve. Yeah, I mean, you know, the uh, educationalist, uh, Carol uh, Carol Dweck, she's written a book called The Growth and Fixed Mindset, where she mm. talks about children's education. She talks just about this, where you can have this fixed mindset, which is about outcomes, where you always want to score well. And what happens with a fixed mindset is that you end up just doing things you're very good at. Because right. if you stretch yourself, then uh, you, you could potentially fail. And unfortunately, most of the education system we have is, is built around this fixed mindset that you, um, you, you, you get rewarded for outcomes, but not for the process. And so you get penalized for, for failing. The alternative to that is what she calls a growth mindset, which is that you should not focus on the outcome. You should focus on the process. So are you constantly stretching yourself? So the, the objective is not, the result it's it's the the journey so to speak so are you doing something that's stretching yourself if you are that you should get the gold star for that mm. if you fail at that it's fine if you do well or, or not that's that's by the by um but each time you do fail you learn though so there's a learning there's a feedback mechanism um but the idea is you should have this growth mindset like are you growing or not um so so that you know she touches on on this and it's, it's she's written a book on this subject which is very good and very helpful for people in all all areas do you think you as individuals started with a growth mindset or do you think you learned how to adapt the way that your mind kind of figures out failure in your own yeah, case. I mean, I think I think I changed over the years, you know, because I think I was definitely in the fixed mindset, just do things I'm very good at and stick with that. Don't experiment so much. But as time goes on, as you get older, you get more mature, you you know, you, you go through setbacks, you're, you're able to switch mm. your mindset. Now, now, of course, these aren't stuck, all of these things. Sometimes I do have a fixed mindset. You know, sometimes I do have a growth mindset. So it's it's not binary. Um, instead, you're, you're constantly sort of changing. But when, when you do go through a sense of failure one can then go back and say okay let, let me put my growth mindset hat on and and see it differently yeah did you did you ever need external um inputs to help you identify when you were like uh, maybe you like being stubborn or resistant to that kind of critical analysis of oneself did you was yeah, that part yeah. of the mentorship process almost for them to flag stuff <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's been a number of different areas where I've had that outside help. One is, you know, having a good line manager is very mm. helpful. So if they are genuinely a good manager, that helps a lot. But more than that, outside of work is very important as well. So outside of work, I got married at a very young age, you know, to to my, uh, you know, st I'm still married. And so being in a relationship is the biggest feedback that you can get, because if you're, especially if you're living with with your partner, because uh, when you start to live with your partner, that's when they really, you really can wind each other up. They know you really, really well. And that's, uh, that's a massive source of feedback that you get constantly, whether it's good or bad or whatever. So, so I think that's been really, really helpful to me. So I've kind of grown up with my partner, who's, you know, my wife, who's, who's just kind of helped me grow as a person. Also, outside of that, I've also, um, um, you know, had sessions for multiple years with psychotherapists, psychologists, you know, where I'd go once a week to sit on a couch and talk about all my issues. And I did that proactively because I realized that I need to improve as a person. I need to understand myself and my biases. And so I just found a psychotherapist to work with them. And sort of, you know, you talk about your childhood and your family and this and that. And, and it really helps a lot to understand why you do things the way you, you, you do. 
Um, and then also I've, I've, you know, participated in lots of different spiritual traditions from different religions, because I think that, you know, while religion can have a bit of a bad rap as being a bit sort of superstitious, but old fashioned, uh, for me, religion is, is a really amazing repository of how you can live a good and healthy life. That's been, that's kind of worked over thousands of years. So it's, it's kind of stood the, the test of time quite well, um, and so I've, I've, I've engaged in lots of different spiritual traditions in different faith traditions and learned a lot through that as well. Mm. Cool. Well, look, the next one kind of is an extension, I guess, in some way of what we've just discussed, which is start with what you fear is one of your other points. Yeah. I mean, this is this this you can look at this at different levels, but at the very basic level, you know, if you think about your when you start your day. Uh, you know, at university or at work or wh whatever your context is, you always have this feeling deep down within you of something you want to avoid that day. <laughs> you know, you have this kind of thing in your gut that says, look, I don't want to talk to that person or, or this project, I don't want to start that project. You know, there's something inside you that tells you like, you know, there's something bad about that, that you don't want to. And so you end up doing everything else that's easy. <laughs> you know, you do the easy projects, you speak to the easy people. But that thing within you that is telling you, you know, to avoid doing something, it's it's actually telling you something important that that's the harder thing that you have to address early on, uh, because it, it's something that's weighing on you somewhere. Um, you know, a classic one is an exam, it, you know, inside you, you know, in the run up to an exam, you have this corrosive sort of pressure. And it's tempting to not revise because then you don't need to think about the exam. But in the end, you have to revise, you know, to pass the exam in the same way, one should look at inside oneself to say, okay, what, what am I scared of doing today? And do that first, because at the start of the day, that's when you have your most energy and just do it. You know, it, it might be having a difficult conversation with somebody or what you perceive to be a difficult conversation, so, you know, because there's some, some, something that happened, you know, days earlier. It could be a project that's particularly tough that you don't, you're just trying to avoid, just do that first. And so the, the point here is that if you start to get in touch with your emotions, in a in a more effective way and and you know having done work with therapists and done all of this type of stuff and being married for a long time you you get a much richer sense of your emotions and so it's tempting to kind of intellectualize everything and say i'm very rational everything's in my head but no you you know another sense that we have is our, our gut and our emotions and that often is a better guide to what you should do um, because your mind can intellectualize and rationalize anything uh, is very good at doing that but your your emotions are harder to manipulate you know they, they just come up within you and so for me every day I kind of think about what is the thing I'm, I'm really trying to avoid today and I try to do that first um, yeah. and, and, and you can apply it over different time horizons and different domains as well. So, so to, talking of kind of productivity then being effective not efficient is that then a kind of the, the next step of this is like, because I, I know for sure, I, I'm definitely part of that camp. Like those feelings are strong within me, as I'm sure, <laughs> within everyone. Put off that thing right to the last possible moment when it needs deliver, delivery. But uh, I guess um, one of the things I, I've certainly found for myself as I've got older and, and I'm more responsible for managing more people or more tasks is that I need to be more effective with how I split my day and allocate my focus to different things. Um, what's your take on being effective then and, and be effective, not um, efficient? Yeah, so the it's a great point. And the distinction I'd make is being efficient at something is whatever you're doing, just doing it really, really well and really quickly. So that's being efficient and that that's great. But the problem is if that thing you're very efficient at is not the thing you should be doing right now, it's pointless. <laughs> being an example I give is let's say your objective is to fly to New York. And what you end up doing is you find the most efficient way of flying to Hong Kong. You know, you find the fastest plane that goes there. What's the point of being in Hong Kong? You do it efficiently, you're supposed to be in New York, you know, and that you can apply that to, to anything and everything. Um, and so I think what often happens in our work life, you know, in the academic sort of side as well, we become so focused on efficiency. Oh, I'm doing this thing really, really, really well that we don't sort of stand up and look, is this the right thing I should be doing? Mm. So, for example, um, when you're doing uh, preparing for an exam in an academic context, you could spend an age uh, studying one particular topic. Yeah, and you know, inside out, um, but the paper will have 
one twentieth of the paper will be on that topic. So why are you devoting so much time to that? It's much more effective to work out what's the range of topics you should know that's likely to be an exam paper. So effectiveness is all about trying to work out what is the right thing to do? What should you prioritize? And people use different terms, the Pareto principle, the 80-20 principle, where often any business, your productivity, your career, it all hinges on 20% of whatever you're doing generates all the revenue often. The, the tail, the 80% doesn't do anything. So each day you need to work out what is the most important thing that I can do that will have the biggest impact on my life or my business or my career and, and focus on that. And that's being effective. So it's not so much let me be really efficient at what I'm doing. It's actually before that you need to work out what should I be efficient at. And too often we end up sort of sleepwalking in our day, day jobs where we confuse being busy doing stuff with being effective. Um, so what you should almost do is like, you know, when you look back at your day, think about, okay, what did I do today that really moves the dial? Hmm. And often it, it can be nothing, you know, sometimes you look back and think, I didn't actually do anything that moves the dial. All I did was I answered some emails. I had one or two random conversations. I, I, did, I was busy, but nothing will really move the dial. And then you've got to reflect why, why was that? So the next day you then think, okay, I'm going to do something today that will move the dial. Mm. As a, like, um, I, I, I was going to say startup, but I think macro hive is yeah. kind of moving beyond that, that, yeah. that point nowadays, but um how often do you, because I know there's a sense of, so this is for the people who are maybe entrepreneurs and they're, you, you can get quite easily caught down in the grass blades of just firefighting all of the days and day, the, the day's occurrences, so to speak. How often do you, do you have to sub, like consciously step out of that and think, I'm going to allocate some time to just actually work out this priority list? Because it's almost like day-to-day -day tasks to be tackled, but then for much more strategic point of view for the direction of say macro hive yeah yeah i'm thinking about that all the time even to this day um mm. because you know at the end what you need to do as a as a start or any business is you need to make sure you have a good product and you need to find clients that will pay for that product you know one way or the other now what sometimes happens is that there's too much focus on the product and you forget about the selling side Mm. Or it could be you're focused too much on the marketing and, and the selling side and you have a terrible product. So it becomes too superficial. So there's always this kind of conflict between the two. And so we're, I'm and the team, we're constantly thinking about what's the right thing to do on, on both sides. And at the same time, we do waste our time on trivial things often. So, for example, um, you know, when we look at our website, you know, we, we could end up spending ages and ages talking about, oh, this should be this font or that font or this should be bigger or smaller. And everyone has an opinion on that, you know, because it's, it's kind of a superficial, you know, visual thing. And then you think we spent five hours on this. Was it really worth it? Was it really <laughs> worth that? So, so we're constantly taking, taking stock of the things that, that we, we need to kind of focus on, but it, it's, it's an important challenge and a, and a balance. Um, and then also one shouldn't also neglect processes as well, because if you don't have the right internal processes, you know, around, um, you know, like when you like, you know, we're a research company. So it's, it's about like publishing at the right time, making sure the publishing process works as though, so, you know, errors. If you neglect that, then everything falls apart as well. And so you've got to work out like what's the most important thing um, out, out of all of those things. Um, and as a startup, you know, because everything's so new, you're, you're constantly trying to work out what the right thing to do is. And there's no, easy answer to to that mm. have you have you actually found that um given that you're a senior person in in macro hive that you are now more involved in strategy and less in what you would do traditionally in the on the research side have you had to like learn to delegate out responsibilities in a slightly different way than perhaps in a well-oiled structured business yeah that's a great question Interesting, it's kind of gone the other way, to be right. honest. So like when we first started the startup, I was probably doing less research and more strategy and management. But as we've grown as a company, we can then delegate and get people to specialize. So now I've had more time for research now than, than before. Um, as we now have other people, there's an individual person that focuses on marketing, there's an individual person that focuses on publishing, whereas before I was doing a bit of everything. So, so you, 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 you can do less of, 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 of that type of thing as, as you grow as a company. Um, but one thing that probably remains is uh, this need to kind of look at things strategically. Um, 
but that doesn't necessarily require huge amounts of time necessarily it just requires every now and then to you for you to take time out mm. even five ten minutes you just think okay where are we going and then go back into into what you're doing yeah okay well look, let's let's dive into the last point learn every day or quit yeah so this this kind of goes back to um i mean it's partly to my personality i'm very curious and i like to learn things um and i think that um learning and growing your knowledge is one of the joys of life and gives you a sense of purpose and you you know it, it just helps in so many different ways and so you know if you're not learning over the course of your day then that should tell you something that should tell you either that you've reached the limit of whatever that role is and you should do something else where you can learn or your attitude is wrong now and i've seen this so many times in people in banks where they get comfort into their comfort zone where they're really good at what they're doing you know they're cruising along they've got their nine to five they've got it all worked out that but, but they're not learning they're not not growing as a person and the learn by learning it can be in different dimensions it can be learning about things within your job you know the product you're working on or skills like am i good at selling or not or presenting or it could be in your personal life you know am i improving as a person you know am i you know, becoming a kinder person, you know, am I better in my relationships? Um, so every day there's an opportunity to learn. Um, and, and learning underlying that is a sense of humility that you don't have all the answers. Uh, and none of us has all the answers. <laughs> that That's just that's just the, the nature of things. Um, so we always can learn. And so we always have to make that decision about learning. And so if you're not learning, then I think I say quit. Maybe you don't need to quit. You need to change your attitude within work. But even if you, if you change your attitude and you're still not learning, then I think you have to leave, you know, because there's, there's, there's a block that's happening there and you're not making use of this amazing capacity we have as humans to take on new information, learn new things. I mean, humans are amazing in that, in that way. And so you're somehow limiting your potential as a person if, if you stay in, in that rut. Mm. In your 25 years, when you were you know, going through this process of learning with the other people around you, because it got to a point where, you know, you're reporting into the direct CEO of, a, of Deutsche yeah. Bank, like sat yeah. right there at the top table, if you like. Is there anything that you observed from those individuals that was like a recurring theme that connected all of these people that were successful at their job i'm not going to say success because that can have different definitions but were uh, effective and, and good at their job yeah i mean i think one thing i i realize when you get to the senior levels of management is that there's people with very different approaches can end up at the top you know that's one thing there's no set pattern i found i mean there, there's a certain level of motivation ambition that they all have um, but they can reach it in different ways. Um, I would also say that there's a big difference between entrepreneurs and people that, you know, move up within a company and become CEO as well. And often people in senior management or banks think they're very entrepreneurial when they're not, you know, they're, they're working for an existing organization. You know, it's almost like being a bureaucrat in some ways, you know, you 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 can work the machine really well and you can end up at the top whereas an entrepreneur is a very different skill set now having been you know on the startup side you realize actually it's very very different um so there's different types of su success um but one key thing when you do see people in senior management at the highest level is that half of the role seems to be around uh, managing perceptions and relationships you know, it, it's kind of a lot more about that that side of things that you're projecting an image about yourself, about the bank, about the institution, mm. um, more so than any sort of technical thing. You know, because you kind of grow up in a bank working on product and this and that. Um, but when you go higher up, it becomes more. You're almost like a statesman <laughs> or a politician in some ways. Yeah. Where, yeah. Um, and the other thing you realize with people at even the highest levels, they in some ways have less and less power than other people do. They're constrained massively because, you know, because the guy at the top, um, they, you know, they delegated running divisions with the people. So they can't just come in and say, you should stop trading like that. It, it's, they've got to like negotiate that sort of difference. They're affected by, you know, shareholders, what the press is doing. So you're in some ways you're really constrained. And I think people don't quite appreciate how constrained people at the top really are people seem to think that okay they're at the top they can change everything but it's it's not that easy for, for them to do that 
and then like reverse engineering that to the the kind of the other end of that kind of pyramid so when you're just starting at let's say the bank there's so much focus and kind of talk about the application process and securing the job there's very little conversation about education around how to be um, effective when you actually start work so at like a graduate level it's almost like you've arrived but then it's like well, what now <laughs> so in 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 hindsight would there be any advice you would give to people at that part of the journey yeah yeah i mean there's there's a couple of things i'd say you know one is don't get so obsessed with the particular product or division you're in i focus a lot on who your line manager will be and by line manager, one thing I look at would be to see what's their track record in managing graduates. Uh, you know, do they, because you can, you can look at manager, they could be a superstar, but then underneath them, they could be high level of churn. You know, they, they, they're high grads, they spit them out, and it's all about the, that, that guy at the top. And then you realize, actually, he's not a good manager. He's very good, but not a good manager. You want to be part of a team where there's examples of graduates who that manager has managed who've ended up doing well. So I'd focus a lot on that to start with. So number one, find a good manager. Make sure you're always learning, especially the technical aspects of your job. It's the early part of your career that you really have an edge in, in doing that. And then the other thing is to just understand the politics of organizations, you know, where you're the, the, the propaganda of the company will always be that it's a meritocracy. If you're good, you'll be noticed. But the reality is that's not often true. You've got to work out who the power players are everywhere. So you know, like, um, you know, who who are the the alphas, you know, who are the most important people when it comes to trading, sales, research, banking, whichever area you're in. Um, and, uh, you know, or, or at the level that's appropriate to you and make sure they know how well you're doing. Um, and, and that's the other part of what you're not taught is how to market yourself. Mm. And because nobody's going to look out for you apart from yourself. You know, if you're lucky, your manager may do, but you've got to make sure that when you've done good work, all the right people know about that good work. So your manager for sure should know, but then let other people know as well about your good work. Um, so it should be based on something real, you know, so when you've done good work, then you market that um, and never take credit for other people's work. That's just bad. You know, that's, that's a bad precedent you're setting and it will come back to bite you later on if that becomes a habit that you have. Um, so, so, so it's 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 kind of more the organizational side. I think that's very important to know. Okay, good stuff. Well, look, I think we've come to the the end of our our time. But where can people? Because I know we look, we've only delved into five of the twenty five. <laughs> so if people want to read the twenty five, where do they need to go? Yeah. So if you go to the MacroHive website, macrohive.com, um, it's on there. Um, in the particular section is if you just go to the news section, there's the 25 lessons are there. So you'll be able to see it uh, hopefully quite prominently. Okay, cool. And then for any of our students out there, okay, if they connect with you on LinkedIn? Absolutely. Feel free to connect <laughs> to me on LinkedIn. You know, you can sign up for a free newsletter on MacroHive as well, you know, to keep in touch with what we're doing. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out and uh, yeah, and continue to, to do your courses at Amplify to the upgrade your skill set. Cool. All right. Bill, always a pleasure. And um, congratulations on 25 years. Here's right. to the next 25. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take care. Right. Thank you.